Good evening, everyone. It's exactly 9.01 p.m. here in Kitchener, Ontario. It's pretty dark out there. We started early in the afternoon, uh, but, and we had a beautiful day. But now, 9 p.m., and we are about to kick off this very last webinar of the day. So thank you guys for joining us for this session. I am Dr. Emmanuel Fontaine from Royal Canin Canada, and I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Rick Kessler from Royal Canin US. So let's check. Rick, are you there? I am here. Thank you all for being here. It should be fun. It will be fun because we will have an English part of the discussion and then we will have a Franklish part as usual. And again, I can tell you today I learned a couple of new words in English thanks to my friend Rick. So we, we never stop learning. Don't stop believing as we say. So guys, can you imagine fall is already upon us? And I can tell you guys, this is definitely not something I'm looking forward to. Because sure, fall also means Halloween, candies, orange, yellow, purple trees, especially here in Canada. And let's be fair, I really enjoy those things. But you know what? I know that right after that, winter is coming. And brrr. When you know that sooner or later, your world will somehow turn into a remake of Frozen. You know, you focus on the positive and you try to enjoy every moment as much as you can. And I can tell you one thing. Summer, our summer was awesome. Weather was great in my part of Canada. And what made it even better and special is that with Rick, we had the chance to attend to a conference which is very dear to my heart, which is the 2016 ISCFR. So if you wonder what a group of veterinarians specialized in canine repro look like, this is what I'm showing you right now. So you see, all those veterinarians are repro specialists from all over the planet. And if you look carefully, here there's a guy who is absolutely not looking at the camera. That should be me. And Rick told me that he's no far, not so far behind. He's around there, so I'm, I still cannot find him, but uh, I'm sure uh, he will send me a picture with the picture with the arrows to tell me where he is. But anyway, we attended to this lecture. And, you know, if you guys wonder what, uh, what ISCFR stands for, it stands for International Symposium on Canine and Feline Reproduction. Let's call it the mecca of the repro specialists in veterinary medicine because this is where we all gather every four years. It is a place to connect you know, with your colleagues from all over the planet and find out what everybody is working on. It's the place to discuss our different ways of working and it is also where we share our approaches and we think of the future of our discipline. And I can't emphasize it enough. It is a great experience that really helps us bring back home a wealth of knowledge and lots of new ideas to implement in our day-to-day -day, day -day activity. So, you know, this year, again, we, we really learned a lot. And some of those studies that were presented will definitely change the way I personally approach canine reproduction. And moreover, Rick had the chance to also attend to the 2016 SFT, SFT stands for Society for Teriogenology, which is, uh, in fact, a, a, a conference that takes place every year in the U.S., and this is where also North American veterinarians who have a special interest in canine repro all gather. So he was able to get me one of the abstract books of this conference, and this is, and I can tell you, I definitely, definitely thoroughly read this one. So you see here, this green book here, this is the abstract book from the 2016 SFT I got thanks to Rick. So we, you see, very, very busy summer in the field of canine repro. And those two events together, they represent two huge abstract books I just showed you, six days of conference, more than 400 pages of scientific presentations on canine reproduction. There were data presented on super fecundation when you use several males for one female, Discussions on biotechnologies of reproduction in canines, something that really gets me going because that's a very interesting field. Uh, there were topics discussed like IVF, in vitro fertilization, ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. You take one oocyte, one sperm, and then it's like playing video games to create an embryo. Uh, there were discussions about semen freezing, or embryo freezing, ovarian cortex freezing in the beach. So, Great, great presentation. Really the place to be if you're, like us, uh, addicted to canine repro. And obviously, guys, in one hour, we won't be able to cover it all. 
So we will only be able to offer you a condensed version. So we came up with what we call our top 10. The top 10 of what we believe might be of interest for you, dog breeders, in your day-to-day -day activities. So guys, sit tight, relax, get ready, because we are about to dive into those new advances in canine repro that are going certainly to change our world, but also your tomorrow. So without further ado, Rick, the online stage is yours. All right. Thank you very much. And again, I'm, I want to thank all the breeders for being here. Uh, my understanding is this is our last canine uh, breeder seminar of the year, and uh, it's been a heck of a ride this year, and I certainly appreciate it. And I, I wanted to take a, a second for you all to know that um, how much I appreciate Dr. Fontaine. He is actually the technological wizard behind all these. I basically don't do much of anything. Um, so hands out to him, and, and uh, I appreciate him much. I see somebody uh, is here from Summertown, Tennessee. I don't know where that is, but I've been stuck in a uh, hotel room in Nashville, Tennessee, all day doing these uh, uh, webinars. But it's been a beautiful day from my uh, window. It's just too bad we haven't had any time to go out there and visit it. So let's get started here. Um, we're going to start with a topic that you're probably all um, basically involved in, and that's infertility. So basically when a bunch of uh, canine repro specialists get together, um, I'll tell you one thing, um, they always speak of infertility cases that they've been involved with. And because basically those cases of infertility, as you know, are very complex and they can be very frustrating. And the reason being is that a lot of times they combine the male and female factors. So. One thing that we want you to know, and I'm sure you all do know and, and agree with us, is that there is one thing that we all know for sure and we should all agree on, is that the number one cause of infertility in canine is mistiming of the day of breeding. That is so important to know. That is why progesterone tests are recommended and they are used to determine the day of ovulation and therefore determine the best time to breed the bitch. So, Let's all agree on that, and then we'll go on to learn things that maybe uh, a lot of us did not know before Dr. Fontaine and I went off on a trip and, and learned a little bit about uh, reproduction. So basically, however, what happens when you have proper timing of ovulation? You use a male dog that is known to be fertile because basically he just sired puppies recently. The bitch is perfectly healthy, gets a good score, um, has a great optimum body condition score, and despite all your efforts and all the efforts of your veterinarian, she is still not pregnant. That's a question that I'm asked on a regular basis, and those cases can add up to be complex mysteries that basically we try to crack. So let's be fair. The differential diagnosis list that is involved in these cases goes on and on and on. So the first thing I want to do is ask you a question. What do you think we should look for into those cases that are of infertility that are hard to solve? Should it be infectious diseases, ovarian cysts? How about uterine disorders or genetic disorders? Take a moment, please, and, and answer that, and then... Give you a few more seconds here for you to think. Okay, three, two, one. So just as in our previous uh, webinars, the infectious diseases got the uh, highest number. Um, and obviously ovarian cysts certainly is something we want to look for, or uterine disorders or genetic disorders. But infectious diseases are always something to consider. And I think basically, um, especially in my practice, but throughout the world, um, the one disease that we basically need to keep in mind always is canine brucellosis. That's my passion that I've been dealing with for over 30 years because it is such a devastating disease to, to dogs and also to breeders. It's an emotional disease as well as an uh, infectious disease. So always keep in mind that uh, infectious diseases can happen to you and, and always keep in mind that we need to be out there testing for brucellosis. We're also big fans of ultrasounds. 
Okay, so we think each infertile bitch that is seen in, by a veterinarian should get one to evaluate the aspects of the ovaries and the uterus, okay, because uterine disorders are a common cause of infertility. And some of those, basically the only sign that we see is infertility. We don't usually look a lot in, in today's world for the genetic side of things, um, for causes of infertility, but in humans they do often. Um, one one item that they look for is called sex hormone receptors defect, and that explains that one cause of infertility in humans. And we'll probably get to that point uh, one day as far as canines, but right now we're not quite there. So as you can see, there are many potential causes. However, you must know, and this is what I hear often or see in the field, and certainly what we read online with breeders, is that the bitch is infertile, it must be a bacterial infection. So, which antibiotic is needed here? So, we basically don't think that this is the right approach to take in these cases. So, don't get us wrong. Bacterial infections can cause infertility. We just got done talking a little bit about brucellosis. But in our experience, um, bacterial infections usually come with clinical signs that we see. We can see vaginitis that can be detected with vaginal smears or endoscopy. We can see vaginal discharge that has an odor or mucousy or pussy. Um, but in a world where there is so much antibiotic resistance, um, we need to be careful in the way that we use those antibiotics. And we can tell you one thing, they are not the go-to solution when it comes to canine infertility. And that is something that was highlighted during the 2016 meeting that Dr. Fontaine and I um, attended. So we're going to start out talking about endometritis. And since 2009, we've been talking a lot about this disease called endometritis. And that basically is the inflammation of the uterus that can disrupt fertility. Endometritis isn't detectable with standard ultrasound techniques at this time. But we have done studies and performed studies show that close to 40% of breeding bitches can suffer from this problem. And that's something to understand also that as your, your bitches age, that, that percentage certainly can climb to a higher number. And endometritis is an inflammation. And we give some thoughts to what is responsible for this inflammation. Basically, I'm sure that most of us would point toward bacterial infections. But there was a study from Argentina that I highlighted on the slide above that looked into this. And they did uterine biopsies on 56 bitches during routine spay and neuter surgery. And for each case, they also sampled the uterus to perform bacteriology. So in this study, and this is basically a, just a thought question that we want you to think about, what do you think was the number of bitches suffering from bacterial endometritis out of that 56? So go ahead and take a guess, no right or wrong here. Give you a few more seconds and then we'll talk about what their results were. Okay. So the majority basically said 20, then 10, then 30. And basically they diagnosed endometritis in 33 bitches out of 56. Okay, that, that's an interesting finding um, because basically they also did not find bacteria that was growing in the uterus, and they only found it in one case out of that 33 bitches with endometritis. So their conclusions is endometritis is common, and more importantly, bacteria do not uh, play a relevant uh, part in, in the endometritis pathogenesis. So to make it simple, it does not appear to be a bacterial disorder, so antibiotics are not needed. On, a, on an interesting side note, they also discussed the use of a blood mar marker called CRP, which stands for C-reactive protein. And that can help um, in the diagnosis and prognosis of the disease. So that means basically to us that a simple blood test could help suspect the problem in infertile bitches. And that's a, that's a very interesting finding for us. So our first takeaway when it comes to infertility in canines Remember that pure inflammation of the uterus with no bacterial um, involvement is frequent. So 
So basically the next question is is that now that the question is on everybody's lips is great, we know what men endometritis is and we basically know it's a common cause of infertility. How do we deal with it? So we have another study that was given to us um, and, and also showed an interesting approach to, to the inflammation. So they tried to find a medical way to approach this problem, and they didn't go for the use of antibodies since they also suspected that endometritis was a pure inflammation. So they went for the use of anti-inflammatory drugs, and that's pretty important. Um, so what they did was they used a very specific protocol combined with intrauterine insemination with transcervical inseminations, and they treated a group of 33 females with a history of three recent unsuccessful consecutive attempts to achieve pregnancy. In those 33 bitches, 10, 43% of them got pregnant, and the mean litter size in this group was 5.6. And those, those results are extremely encouraging, okay? So we haven't yet found a solution to all fertility issues in the bitch, but those two studies, however, confirm that endometritis is a frequent problem that impacts fertility and that new medical approaches can be successful. So there again, what's our takeaway? So the most important to me is that antibiotics are not the go-to solution in infertile bitches. That is of utmost importance these days because in human medicine, it's been recently identified that there is a uterine microbiome, sort of like the microbiome we have in our gut and our dogs have in their GI tract. And that's bacteria living in the uterus and play an active part in maintaining a healthy uterine environment. And the same goes for our normal vaginal bacteria flora and the bitch. So inappropriate uses of antibiotics since certainly can disrupt this microbiome and, in fact, create issues that were not there before. So don't get us wrong. Antibiotics are great drugs that we have at our disposal. But these studies remind us that we should use them wisely, especially, again, in this day and age of antibiotic resistance. So the number two takeaway is that antibiotics are not the only solution that we have at our disposal. So the most exciting part of uh, the meetings for me, and, and I know Dr. Emanuel, what was shared in the field of canine neonatology, because both he and I have had a long interest in neonatology. Um, when, when I first started practicing, nobody even discussed neonatology or felt that it was an important part of reproduction. Um, but basically now we know that uh, it's an important field and growing, and we certainly uh, came up with a lot of good information at the meetings that we went to. <clears throat> and we want to bring this slide up and want you to take a look at it. Um, this is basically... Um, the groundbreaking work that's been um, involved in neonatology has basically been done a lot by this research group called NeoCare, and they're based at the French Veterinary School of Toulouse. Um, Dr. Emmanuel says they have a great Facebook page, um, and they're a very active great, uh, group, and they want you to go on there and, and share info in the field of canine reproduction. So um, do that. It's really important because the more information um, that we share with this group and that they share with us will go a long way in, in advancing neonatology to where we want. So the NeoCare studies are, are really impressive to us because they started one in 2010 and been ongoing since then. They have monitored 726 puppies and analyzed more than 15,000 clinical parameters that have never been analyzed before. Um, so that certainly goes a long way way right there to advance neonatology. So one thing we can tell you for sure, those numbers are huge in the field like K9 neonatology, and no one else up to this date has that's been accomplished. So groundbreaking, it definitely is. So every piece of information we get to know in this field is important, since in puppies we are still struggling with an average of about 20% neonatality um, mortality rate which is far from being negligible. So anything we can do to bring down that percentage um, goes a long way to, to saving these puppies. So first, we know that neonatal survival is affected by what we call maternal factors. Factors, they have to do with what happens during gestation, parturition, 
and even lactation, and that can have an impact on these newborns. So we won't be able to cover everything that was discussed during those two meetings, but we're going to talk a little bit about the highlights that we think that you ought to be interested in. So the first one is a picture of what we call gangrenous mastitis. And basically what we're seeing here is that purple area you see basically tells us there's a huge abscess developing underneath the skin. And this is definitely the most severe form of mastitis that you can encounter in bitches, and it will always lead to a rupture of the abscess, leaving a huge hole in this location. And obviously if that happens, um, it interferes with lactation. The other thing that we have to worry about is that puppies ingest this milk are probably going to get sick, and that's not something we want. And in gangrenous mastitis, it's very common for the bitch to show signs of illness. The next type of mastitis that we want you to be aware of is more classical form of mastitis. And basically, in veterinary medicine, we call this acute mastitis. It's not something uncommon in breeding kennels at all. So if you palpate the affected mammary glands, you're going to feel that it's warm. And you can basically see that by the redness that's around that, that mammary gland. It's going to be painful and it's going to be hard. The other thing that we're going to notice is that the color of the milk is going to be affected, and it usually goes from brown to red, and a lot of times might even have small chunks in there on occasions. So that reminds us why it is so important for you to palpate the mammary glands of your lactating bitch on a daily basis to make sure that they are not developing these cases of mastitis. Now the interesting case of mastitis that we want to spend a little bit more time on is basically if we look at these mammary glands, they, they appear normal to me, and I'm sure they appear normal to you. So even if we were to palpate them, we probably wouldn't feel any abnormalities or modifications of the gland. And yet this is a picture of a bitch also suffering from mastitis. It's a different kind of mastitis that we're dealing with here. It's not gangrenous. It's not acute. Okay? But this is what we call and refer to as subclinical mastitis. And I can tell you that this kind of problem often makes us scratch our heads in veterinary clinics because the definition tells it all. There are no real clinical signs for us to determine what is wrong. We would usually suspect it when we see clinical signs. But those clinical signs that we see are on the, with the puppies. They cry, they lose weight, and they even die sometimes. So it's definitely a tricky disorder to deal with. And any time we have those signs in puppies, we need to go back and check the bitch to see if we can determine if she does have subclinical mastitis. Tricky and not well studied in canines. So it's a problem since, as we just mentioned, it impacts the newborn's puppy's health. There was also a concern because so far, mastitis in the bitch has only been described as a bacterial infection. So antibiotics are required as part of the medical treatment. If their use is totally justified in the presence of evident clinical signs, well, how can we be sure in the case of subclinical ones if they're needed? So which one of those bitches does not suffer from mastitis of the pictures we just saw? All right, we'll give you a couple more seconds, and it seems like everybody said that they all suffer from mastitis. And indeed they do. So let's review them. Again, we have a case of gangrenous mastitis with obvious clinical signs. We have a case of acute mastitis, and we're, we can see obvious uh, clinical signs in this case and certainly ones that we can palpate. But then again, when we're looking at subclinical mastitis, we have questions. So imagine how great it would be if tomorrow we could come up with an easy-to-perform test that could tell us whether or not there is a subclinical mastitis. We could use it beforehand in terms of prevention to make sure the puppies nurse at no risk. And in the worst-case scenario, if we end up seeing clinical signs, we could use it as a diagnostic tool to confirm whether or not we are indeed dealing with a subclinical disorder that we need to treat. That would be great. Well, let's take a look at this. 
this is a slide of basically cells, red blood cells and white blood cells. And those large cells that you're seeing are what we call neutrophils. And they belong to a group of cells we call polymorphonuclear cells. Okay? And those are considered as markers of inflammation. So in other species, ruminants especially, such as cows and goats, they are used to determine whether there is mammary infl inflammation or not, especially the subclinical ones we just mentioned. There are many different ways to count these cells, but one very simple approach is actually what we're looking at, is that we take a little bit of milk from the mammary gland, drop it on a slide, have a look at it under a microscope to perform what we call cytology. And that's what this slide is basically a picture of. Okay? We would evaluate how many of those cells we see, and based on their amount, we would be able to suspect or not an underlying disease. So why don't we use this in canine reproduction? Historically, we have been told that numbers are hard to basically evaluate, um, and they don't really have clinical indication. But what we used to know and what we know now is totally different. So we know now that cytology plays a huge role when we're looking at subclinical mastitis. So the study above is from our friends at NeoCare, and they collect samples of 422 milk samples from 50 bitches, and that's a lot of milk samples, in order to evaluate an easy-to-use method of inflammatory cell count in the bitch, as we just talked about. And they were able to find a threshold defining mastitis in the bitch. So in itself, this is great news because it opens the door for the use of this easy-to-use test on our bitches and probably will complement the measures that are already taken to optimize mammary gland health during lactation. So they also found out the prevalence of the disease was 10.7%, and that's definitely not negligible. So what is interesting to me is that they found out that any mammary gland could be affected. We used to say that this was basically a problem of the last mammary glands or the abdominal uh, mammary glands, and they were more predisposed to this kind of problem. But in fact, this appears not to be the case. All mammary glands should be evaluated individually if we go down this path then. They also found that the presence of a subclinical mastitis was associated with neonatal mortality, but only between day three and day seven after parturition. So interesting, it was not associated with puppy's growth rate, certainly because puppies don't just stay on one teeth, and that, in fact, most bitches only have one gland that is in playing. So those are all important findings that lead us basically to our third takeaway, and that is subclinical mastitis does pose a risk for newborn puppies' health. And it reminds us that this is important to maintain those daily measures to monitor mammary gland health during lactation. So daily palpation of each gland, checking the color of the milk, check for hardness, check for heat, check for pain. So those new diagnostic tools are still under development for sure, but it's a great first step to take. Dog breeders can benefit from this research very soon to better detect these subclinical mastitis and yet potentially problematic diseases. So what's our takeaway? New options to detect subclinical diseases going to be important. But wait, some of you might say, if it's a bacterial disorder, why don't we just perform a bacteriology on, on a milk sample and then treat accordingly? We can just do a culture and sensitivity. And that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? But what happens is that each mammary gland potentially can be infected. So if we're going to go down that path, we would need to check each and every one of those mammary glands independently, and that's not really practical. So the conclusion of the study from Italy that's above will also help us a great deal here. They had a rather similar idea from the previous study we just discussed, find a way to detect subclinical mastitis. And they did things just a little bit differently. They collected milk samples, and to evaluate presence of inflammation, they did bacteriology and cytology on the samples. And what they found is that isolation of bacteria from milk is very common. 
and is not indicative of mammary gland infection. So let me repeat that. They found bacteria in a majority of the milk samples and determined that that is not the cause of the mastitis. So what do we do next? We look for correlations between cytology, okay, because we need to run cytology um, to correctly interpret these bacteriological findings because without one or the other, then we can't put those together. So therefore, you need to correlate these tests, and that's what we need to do. So in our opinion, we have to have a really simple tool that can definitely help us optimize mammary gland health during lactation. So no doubt dog breeders will benefit from this in their day-to-day -day activity. So our takeaway number four is look for correlations between these tests. And then the last thing that I want to leave you with is uh, my last poll question is, what is the most dangerous infectious disease in growing puppies that you're concerned about? Would that be distemper? Would that be parvo? Infectious hepatitis? Kennel cough? Give you a few more seconds and then we'll move on. All right. And the results are the majority of you are con mostly concerned about parvo with other infectious diseases coming behind, distemper, obviously, infectious hepatitis and kennel cough. So infectious diseases are a threat we all fear, especially when we have puppies. And in terms of canine infectious diseases, I think basically we all should put at the top of our list um, of every dog breeder and every veterinarian is canine parvo. Um, some breeders believe this is a disease from the past, but I'm here to tell you, and I think Dr. Manuel will totally agree with me, it is not, and it remains the most common cause of pediatric mortality in puppies, especially at the time of weaning. So this, however, leads to other questions. If we agree that parvo is such a big threat, how does it enter our kennels? Okay. So proper vaccination certainly plays a role. In your kennel, all your bitches are properly vaccinated against parvo. And remember, this is still the best way to protect our dogs against it. You use the right cleaning and disinfecting protocol. You are on top of things on sanitation measures and foot traffic in your kennel. And nothing gets in and out. So basically, in the, in the real world, you don't build a huge wall surrounding your kennel, but you may and you prevent any life form from getting too close. And you do not go out, and you do not allow anybody in. Now, we certainly agree that uh, that's pretty hard to achieve it, but let's just say that you do it. And what if I tell you that, despite that, you could still end up with parvo infection in your puppies? So, could you still get parvo infections? Well, certainly you can, and this is what we learned, okay? And you need to know about it because we need to be concerned about parvovirus, okay? So this abstract that we're looking at, this is what they discussed. They wanted to determine whether vaccinated dams could excrete canine parvovirus from mating to the end of lactation and so be a potential source of infection in breeding kennels. And basically, we will skip the details, but the answer is yes. Bitches were found to have a high viral load in their feces during lactation. And the later they were in the lactation, the higher the viral excretions. So in this study, none of the bitches developed any clinical signs of parvo, even though they were excreting the virus, because they were properly vaccinated. But the fact is that they were actively spreading the disease, indicating that vaccinated dams may contribute to canine parvovirus exposure in kennels. On a positive note, they also followed the puppies of these dams, and at certain points, 76% of those puppies were also shedding the virus during that time. The good news is that only 14% of those puppies experienced diarrhea, and most of them remained asymptomatic. And the overall mortality in puppies was about 3%. So those puppies might have certainly been protected by the immunity they received at birth, via the claustrum that they received. So our takeaway number five, parvo must always be considered as a risk in breeding kennels, especially for puppies at weaning. 
Previous studies have always demonstrated that parvo circulation does not always cause the severe hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome that we all fear, but it still can cause mild diarrhea in puppies, and that mild diarrhea can lead to other problems that we see. So it is therefore always important to stay on top of things when it comes to sanitary prevention of the disease. Sanitation procedures with the right disinfectants um, in the maternity ward or nursery ward will be of the m utmost importance, even if you do not allow anybody from outside in your kennel during this period. So in your dog breeder's toolkit, you definitely need whatever happens to keep a good sanitation protocol against parvo. So takeaway number five, in breeding kennels, never overlook parvo. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Emanuel. So thank you all. So thank you very much, Rick. So hello again, guys. And this is now time for me to start the Franklish part of the session. And as Rick told you, uh, we were definitely very excited to hear all those new things around canine neonatology. And you know when I lecture on canine neonatology, there's always a little story I like to tell. And maybe you heard it already because I tell it all the time. But when I was a young veterinarian, I remember on the December 24th evening, while I was doing emergency calls, uh, a couple brought me a three-day-old puppy in consultations. And they thought it was not doing well, you know, but they were not really sure. And I hate to say this, but early in my career, I really had no idea how to approach this type of situation. I had been essentially trained, you know, to deal with adult dogs or adult cats eventually growing puppies or kittens. But newborn, that was definitely an unknown territory. And fortunately, since then, I learned quite a lot. And I know that we already shared our thoughts on this specific field of veterinary medicine in previous webinars that you can refer to as well. But uh, I truly believe that there's still so much to learn, especially in how to handle and assess newborn puppies. And guys, tell me, what do you need the most to monitor a newborn puppy's health? According to you, what do you need the most to make sure that your newborn puppies are healthy? Do you need a veterinarian? That would be cool, eh? <laughs> do you need a thermometer, a scale, a stethoscope? Tell me, what's the most important thing you think is required to make sure that your puppies are healthy? So I'll leave you five more seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. Okay. And I fully agree with 80% of you. Uh, you said a scale. And, you know, when I do presentations on canine neonatology, I always tell breeders, in your maternity, it's imperative that you have access to a scale, but also a thermometer. So those are the two most important things and the two best tools we have to date to monitor puppies' health. But thanks to the NeoCare studies, I can tell you that I learned lots of new things at the 2016 ISCFR. And the first, thing I, the first important thing that I learned had to do with neonatal mortality in newborn puppies because the new NeoCare studies, in fact, showed the following. They showed that, in fact, look at this big red number. 81.1% of newborn puppies will die, that are dying during the first 48 hours of life, they had a low birth weight, this. So, and this number is huge. 81.1% of newborn puppies with low birth weight will die during the first 48 hours after they are born. So that tells you that the weight at birth has a huge impact. And this is a factor that can help us quickly identify those puppies at risk. But, okay, okay, that definitely emphasizes the importance of keeping a scale handy. But there's obviously a trick here. If I were to ask you, how do you define, how do you define what a low birth weight is? So tell me on the chat, what is low birth weight for a newborn puppy? Can you tell me on the chat what it means for you? So don't be shy and... Tell us on the chat, what does low birth weight mean for you in your own breeding kennel? Yeah. 
don't be shy, guys. Remember, I'm the one not speaking English. So, so oh, answers are coming. I shouldn't have said that. I know that it takes time for my voice to travel through the Internet and to reach you guys. So low, low in comparison to other tops in the letters. I usually go by size. So somebody tells me four ounces. Depends on the breed. Depends on the liter size. Less than 12 ounces. So you see, guys, oh, oh, and all the answers are coming. Smaller than average. In English letters, less than six ounces. Lower weight than average. And you see, all of you came, come up, came up with different answers. And that's the point I really want to, to, show, to, to point out here. I'm sure we will all agree that there are many factors that will influence the weight of the newborn puppies at birth. The litter size, for instance, the bigger of the litter, the smaller of the puppies. The nutrition during gestation, we know that the way the bitch is fed during uh, gestation will impact the weight of the puppies at birth. The breed, obviously, because depending on the breed you are, you are in, you will see difference in terms of uh, weight at birth. So there are average values that you can find in veterinary textbooks, and I gave you some examples here, and you can use them as references. But in the neocare studies, they define it, they define low birth weight as the lowest 25% registered values for a given liter. And I mean, you guys, as you said, can also come up and, uh, with your experience and use your experience. I would definitely encourage you to do that and define low birth weight as weight below what you usually see or what you usually expect. But one important fact remains, in my opinion. It is definitely important to identify those individuals right after they are born and immediately take extra care, like, for instance, milk replacer supplementation, because the sooner you'll start taking care of them, the better the outcome. On a side note, be aware that our friends at NeoCare are currently working on growth curves in puppies, and their objective is to be able one day to provide growth curve data per breed. So if you have some of those data, because some of those data... Uh, I know that very often breeders do record the weight of the puppies on a daily basis, which, by the way, is a great habit to have. But if you have those data, don't hesitate to share them with the NeoCare group and just go on their Facebook page and tell them about it. Tell, tell them we sent you, uh, because I truly believe that the more growth curves we, have, we will have available, the better it will be for the dog breeding community because we are really lacking those data, and it's very hard today still to say this is really low birth weight because we don't have those growth curves per breed. But wait a minute. Okay, so you understood that identifying puppies with low birth weight is of, is of the utmost importance. But I'm pretty sure at this point, many of you are thinking that, okay, this is not necessarily a huge breakthrough in canine neonatology. We now just have more numbers to back up what we already thought. I mean, it emphasizes the importance of having a scale at home to weight your puppies, but that's for sure. But however, that's a recommendation that has been given for many, many years already. But you know, this is where it gets interesting because there's obviously more to it. The NeoCare group introduced a new indicator, which is called early growth rate. So I'm sure you've all heard this sentence. Puppies can lose up to 10% of their, in their birth weight during the first day after they are born, but then they should gain weight. You know, this is written in many veterinary textbooks. And myself, I said this in many presentations over the years. The NeoCare studies demonstrated, however, that in fact, this is not true. Anytime puppies lose weight, there is a risk for them. And that's what the early growth rate, which is defined as that, tells us and shows us. The NeoCare studies showed that the optimal cutoff value of growth rate during the first 48 hours of life to assess predictive likelihood of mortality was minus 4%. Minus 4%. Let's put things into perspective. If you have a puppy that is born and that weighs 100 grams, Sorry, I speak in grams, but if the puppy weighs 100 grams, if this puppy lo loses 4 grams the first day of life, this puppy is at risk. And in fact, if this happens, if this puppy loses 4 grams, 
the risk this puppy dies during the neonatal period increases eightfold. And that's huge. So think about it. The NeoCare study showed that if this pu those puppies lose more than 4% of their initial birth weight during the first day of life, their neonatal mortality rate will be around 40%. While on the other hand, puppies above this threshold will experience a neonatal mortality rate of only 5%. Huge difference, right? Huge difference. And this, again, re-emphasizes something we always tell. If there's one thing you guys definitely, definitely need to monitor your puppy's health, again, it's a scale. And remember, they should not lose weight at all, at all, especially the first day after they're born. And this is very different from what we used to say in the past. So, you see, uh, in, uh, something else I wanted to tell you. In my, in, in my presentations on canine neonatology, we always speak about what we call the 3H syndrome. And 3H stands for hypothermia, hypoglycemia, dehydration. So we always believe that the 3H syndrome is one of the most common causes of neonatal mortality in puppies. And that's why we recommend the scale and the thermometer, in fact, to make sure that they are not losing weight. And now you know that you also need to check about the low birth weight and to make sure they are, they are not suffering from hypothermia. But when I attended to those conferences, in fact, there was a special focus on the hypoglycemia part. So to tell you the truth, until now, I always considered it was more of a clinical diagnosis in puppies because you will think of hypoglycemia when you observe weakness, lethargy, eventually seizures in those newborn puppies. And of course, you can take blood samples to analyze the blood glucose concentration in those puppies. But, but let's face it, I mean, in the field, especially newborn puppies, this is not something we do in routine. So the results of my colleague from NeoCare showed a relationship between blood glucose in puppies and neonatal mortality risk. And there are two things that were really striking for me here. The first one is that they showed that neonatal mortality was increased fourfold if the puppy's blood glucose concentrations was found below 0.9 gram per liter. So, you know, I spent a lot of time reading textbooks when I was preparing my exam board when I was at the university. And you see that finding? It really changed the way, and it will really change the way I approach canine neonatology. I can tell you that. Because in textbooks, it is mentioned that hypoglycemia is defined in newborns when blood glucose levels drop below 0.4 gram per liter. 0.4. And when you look at this here, it tells you that the risk of neonatal mortality is increased fourfold if it drops below 0.9 gram per liter. So again, there's quite a gap here. And the neonate, new care studies really showed us that the problem arises earlier than what we thought. And here, what, would you, what you guys would probably say, I mean, okay, great, but that again is mainly for veterinarians who can perform and run blood samples inside their clinic. What's the point for us, dog breeders? And you know what? In fact, this is where I was really astonished. Because in their studies, those measures were performed directly at the kennel, right next to the puppies. Some of them were even done by the breeders participating to their studies. So, you know, when they told me that, I couldn't help but ask him. I said, okay, guys, how do you, did you do that? Did you only work with breeders with medical skills that know how to draw blood? And I can tell you, drawing blood in a newborn, especially this newborn, is not doing well. <laughs> guys, that's quite challenging. And they told me, no, absolutely not. In fact, this is what they used they use a portable glucometer from human medicine designed for diabetic people. And instead of pricking their finger to collect a blood sample, they prick the puppies here. So the key point for my friends at NeoCare was to come up with a solution with something that any breeder could do by themselves. And you see this. It's simple, easy, efficient, and it helps detect puppies at risk as soon as 24 hours after they're born. So in the future, I definitely foresee that this kind of tool could become integral part of the dog breeder's toolkit. It will be a nice complement 
the, uh, to the scale and the thermometer. And it will definitely allow us to be more accurate at determining at-risk newborn puppies and immediately take preventive measures to optimize their chances of survival. So you see, those new care studies gave us three new criteria we can focus on to identify at-risk puppies for neonatal mortality. Low birth weight, early growth rate, and blood glucose levels. And this is now something any breeder can use. And, a, and that will definitely help us determine when we need to initiate preventive measures to optimize the survival, survival chances of those puppies. Okay, this is great for me, but you know what? There is even more. And the biggest breakthrough, in my opinion, that was presented during this conference was without any doubt around canine colostrum. So remember, this colostrum is the first meal that is produced by the mother. And I have a question for you guys here. What do you think is the most important thing colostrum provides to newborn puppies? Does it provide nothing of value? Does it provide immunity? Does it provide energy? Does it provide energy plus immunity? So tell me, guys, what is the most important thing colostrum will provide to newborn puppies? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and I fully agree with 85% of you guys that immunity plus uh, that colostrum will pro provide immunity plus energy. So for sure, colostrum is this first milk produced by the bitch that contains immunoglobulins and that will somehow uh, transfer the immunity of the mother to the puppies. But remember that it's always a combination of two things. Colostrum is also an energy booster. So you want the puppies to drink the colostrum so that they receive immunity, but also you want them to receive energy as well. And I, as I said, colostrum contains what we call immunoglobulins, and those are immune proteins that, after they are drunk by the puppy, will in fact pass the puppy's intestinal barrier to create what we refer to again as passive immune transfer from the mother to the puppies. By drinking the colostrum, puppies will receive immunity against the diseases the mother is vaccinated for. And that is, again, why it's so important to vaccinate them, especially against parvo. And they will also receive immunity against the diseases the mother encountered during her life. And one thing I can tell you, and I, that I think is important to remind you guys here, is that immunity transfer, when it comes to colostrum, it's all about timing because colostrum is only produced during the first 24 hours of lactation. However, we know that the amount of immunoglobulins it contains dramatically decreases very, very quickly, and that could become a problem in case of prolonged delivery, for instance, exposing puppies that are born uh, later in the parturition process to the risk of deficit of passive immune transfer. We also know that from previous studies, Colostrum in puppies is only absorbed during the first 12 to 16 hours after they're born. And it starts to dramatically decrease. The absorption rate in puppies dramatically decreases as soon as four hours after birth. So again, after that, immunoglobulins are no more able to go through the intestinal barrier and will therefore not provide them with this immune protection uh, they, lack, they totally lack right after birth. So you understand this is kind of a race, right? And you want to make sure that your puppies will drink the colostrum as soon as possible after they are born, which leads me to a question I have for you guys. So look at this picture. I'm sure you know that a bitch typically has five pairs of mammary glands. So you see I put numbers uh, for, to, to refer to the different pairs of mammary glands, pair one, pair two, pair three, pair four, pair five, on which pair would you like the puppies to drink first to make sure they get the colostrum? So tell me, on which pair of mammary glands would you like the puppy to, circle, to, to nurse to make sure they get the, the best colostrum ever from the, from the beach? So tell me, would you, do you want to use the first, mammary, the, the first pair of mammary glands, which were the abdominal ones? Do you go for the number two, three, four, five? Which one would you pick? Okay, so I feel that 
Most of you will go for the abdominal mammary glands, the ones that are closer to the tail. And you know what? Usually this is what I hear in the field. I hear that colostrum quality must be better in the abdominal mammary glands because they are the ones producing more milk. And to tell you the truth, that was the assumption I also made. However, what the Neocare study showed us, in fact, is that colostrum quality vary widely from one mammary gland to the other. In fact, in real life, you currently have no way to predict which one, which of the mammary gland will give the best quality colostrum. Variations from one mammary gland to the other in terms of immunoglobulin concentration vary widely. Look, a variation of 40, more or less 32%. That's huge. Main problem we have so far, there's no qualitative way to assess the quality of the colostrum in routine. If, you, if you've been working or if you have been involved with uh, equines in males, for instance, we can use something we call refractometers that will help us determine if it's good quality colostrum or not. In bitches, the Neocare group, they tried to use the same technique and they found out that it doesn't work. It doesn't correlate with the bitch colostrum because of the, the difference in terms of composition. So, so far, we have no way to tell what, uh, to tell very easily uh, if the colostrum the puppies are nursing on is good quality or not. And that, that point seven, really makes it pretty tough because uh, it's hard to make sure that our puppies indeed get the colostrum we, want them to, we, we so want them to drink when we know that there are high variations between each mammary gland. So, okay, we know that puppies need to drink the colostrum to be better protected and to get this energy booster. We know whether that there are huge variations in colostrum quality from one mammary gland to the other. And we also know that timing can be an issue because especially in prolonged deliveries, we're never really sure if they will be able to get the colostrum or not. So how big a deal it is, is it uh, if puppies don't get to drink it? And that's what the NeoCare group focused on in their studies. And they found something really interesting. So you see they did blood samples on newborn puppies and they evaluated the immunoglobulin concentration in the blood of those puppies. And they determined, again, uh, a cutoff value about, uh, that would help them assess, again, the predictive likelihood of mortality in those puppies. So if you are interested in this threshold was in fact 2.3 grams per liter. And when puppies' immunoglobulin concentrations were above this value, their neonatal mortality rate was 4.9%, which again, it's not that high. And uh, remember, in, in the average canine population, we're dealing with a 20% neonatal mortality rate. So when they get the colostrum, when they have more than 2.3 grams per liter of immunoglobulins in their blood, 4.9% neonatal mortality rate to expect. But when they are below this threshold, this is the neonatal mortality rate you might end up dealing with, 44.4%. And here again, that's quite a huge difference, right? And they also found in their studies that, in fact, this problem would concern 18.1% of the newborn puppies. So 18.1% of the puppies didn't get the colostrum. And that means that, in fact, uh, you see, uh, in, uh, in those puppies, we know in those 18.1% of puppies, we know that from what I just showed you, that around half of them will not make it. So definitely failure of cholesterol transfer critically impacts survival rate of the newborn puppies. So now you guys must start thinking, okay, great, this is a problem, but I still have no way to determine if the puppies drink the colostrum properly, and I'm not going to do blood samples in newborns to evaluate their immunoglobulin concentration. doesn't seem really practical. So what could you do? So what do you think you could do to try to assess the fact that puppies properly drank the colostrum. Do you think you should focus on the activity level? Do you think you should focus on the blood glucose levels? Do you think you should focus on the weight gain or on the temperature of those puppies? What do you think would be the best way to, make, to assess the fact that those puppies drank the colostrum, according to you?
Okay, so I see that 70% of you, oh, it keeps changing. That's what I like about those charts. They keep moving in all directions. But most of you believe that weight gain is the way to go. And you know what? That's exactly what the NeoCare studies found. And they found that a very simple way to assess colostrum intake in puppies was weight gain. They found that there was a high correlation between early weight gain, this early growth rate I showed you, and colostrum intake, and that early, gain weight, early weight gain sorry, was a very simple and easy way to evaluate if those puppies drank the colostrum or not. So it comes back to what we were saying before. Having a scale in newborn puppies is still of the utmost importance. So, so far, what did we learn from those NeoCare studies? We learned that there are factors that can be monitored to detect at-risk puppies, like low birth weight, blood glucose levels, and early growth rate. And, the, and we can detect those newborn puppies at risk very soon during their growth period. And the NeoCare study also identified that failure of cholesterol transfer could be a risk factor as well. And you know, the great thing is that they didn't, end, they didn't stop there. They really wanted to come up with solutions to help those at-risk puppies. So their first hypothesis was that energy intake right after birth may be one factor limiting puppy survival and that failure of colostrum transfer and therefore negative, negative early growth could contribute to that. So what they did is that they evaluated the impact of early supplementation of puppies with a milk replacer and rich with a glucose polymer. And this glucose polymer is called maltodextrin. So you see maltodextrin is quite interesting because maltodextrin is used in formulas for premature human babies because it is absorbed faster at the digestive tract level. And when we consider the weight and the, stage, and, and, and the stage of development of puppies at birth, well, they share many similarities with premature human babies. So supplemented puppies receive this enriched milk replacer every six hours, from 12 to 48 hours after they were born. And the conclusions of the NeoCare studies were that, in fact, the supplemented group had a significantly higher growth rate at 48 hours. So remember that they came up with many ways to identify puppies at risk for neonatal mortality. And they noticed that when they were supplementing with maltodextrin, they were significantly decreasing the number of puppies at risk. So that was great because this clearly highlighted the fact that supplementation with maltodextrin is a strategy to look into when you detect an at-risk newborn. And again, they didn't stop there. Because, you know, as we mentioned, colostrum brings energy for sure, but it also brings immunity. So they, were, they started looking into a way to provide this immunity eventually if puppies were not receiving it. So what they did is that uh, they tried to use what we call hyperimmune plasma. So hyperimmune plasma, in fact, is this part of the blood of the dogs that contain antibodies. So they collected blood on dogs that, are, that were routinely vaccinated, centrifugated it, and, take, and took the plasma. And you know, this is something that has already been done in previous studies, but they used it in a slightly different way because they, those, uh, those puppies that were supplemented with plasma, they received plasma at birth and subsequently every two days until day 56. And then, so again, they had a control group and a supplemented group, and they compared both groups at the end of the treatment period. And again, they found a significant association between weight gain and supplementation. And this association was even more important in large breed puppies. And they found out that supplemented large breed puppies during the experiment period, they gained more weight, and it's close to plus 600 grams, uh, they gain more weight than the controls. So what they also found, which is really cool, is that, you see, in this study, they decided to analyze the digestive microbiome uh, of those puppies. And Rick already speak a little bit about the microbiome, those bacteria in the guts that are healthy and that promote health somehow. And in fact, when they compared the digestive microbiome of those two groups, the supplemented puppies with hyperimmune plasma and the puppies that were not supplemented, they again found a difference. In puppies that were supplemented, in fact, 
Clostridium, which are the poster picture of the bad bacteria, uh, they were less represented in puppies supplemented, while la whereas Lactobacillus, which are seen as the healthy bacteria from the gut, well, they were more represented in puppies that were supplemented. So this is of particular interest in large breed puppies since we know that they've been demonstrated to be more susceptible to diarrhea, especially during the pre-weaning period. And we know that the digestive microbiome plays a role in the development of uh, the diarrhea. So their hypothesis was therefore that, you know, hyper, hyperimmune supplementation does affect, does positively affect the digestive and global health of puppies. But you know what? The story doesn't end here. Because, okay, they identify that hyperimmune plasma could be an interesting solution to look into and that puppies could benefit from it if, uh, if they were receiving this uh, over a 56-day period. But it does represent a lot of blood to draw on a regular basis and to prepare in order to administer it to the, pet, to, to the puppies. So from a practical standpoint, it's not so simple to make it happen. So they tried a similar experiment, but this time, however, they used something slightly different. They used what we call a hyperimmune egg yolk powder. So in fact, that must sound a little bit weird for you guys, but let me quickly explain. So the concept of hyperimmune egg powder supplementation is not really something new, and in fact, it's based on what we call the chicken IgY. So Chicken Ig wines are, in fact, the immunoglobulins we found in chicken, and they accumulate in the egg yolk. So to make it super short, you vaccinate the chicken against diseases that could potentially harm the newborns. Those chickens will produce specific antibodies against this, this, those diseases, and those antibodies, those IgY, will accumulate inside the egg yolk. You recover the egg yolk, you turn it into powder, you dehydrate it, basically, and you have a hyperimmune powder targeting your pathogens of interest newborns can benefit from. So this concept, guys, has been proposed as an alternative to antibiotics in farm animals. And egg powder administration has been shown to significantly reduce the risk of GI infection in mice, poultry, piglets, cows. So now we have the technology. The technology is available. So the NeoCare group, they obtain a hyperimmune egg yolk powder containing specific antibodies against canine parvo and E. coli. So I know that we already mentioned the importance of canine parvo, but it's good to note as well that E. coli today is considered as the most common bacterial cause of neonatal mortality in puppies. So you see, what they did is that they added this egg yolk powder to a canine milk replacer, and they tried its efficacy the exact same way they did with the hyperimmune plasma. And their findings were really similar to what they observed with, hyperimmune, uh, with the hyperimmune plasma solution. In fact, in large breed puppies especially, supplemented puppies gain more weight during the entire neonatal period. And as we discussed before, better growth during the neonatal period usually means better health. So you see, those neocare studies clearly highlighted the interest and the importance of immunoglobulin supplementation, whether it is with hyperimmune plasma or hyperimmune egg powder, egg yolk powder, in newborn puppies, and that those things could definitely positively impact their health. So they came up with a statement, and this statement was the following. The perfect hyperimmune solution should provide the newborns not only with specific passive immunity, but also with nutrients and energy. Remember, this is why they did this experiment with maltodextrin. And you know what? Their studies gave birth to this. So this, my friends, is what we call ProTech. And this is the new generation of milk replacers. It contains the maltodextrin we touched on. And thanks to the IJY technology, it also contains those immunoglobulins, again, Parvo and E. coli, that were used in the NeoCare study. So after what I just told you, you understand that uh, when you understand the studies behind this product, uh, you can understand how excited I was when I found out about this product. I mean, when I, when I took, shoot this picture in last June, I was just bunting up and down because that's, for me, that's huge in the field of canine neonatology. This product has just been launched in Europe and uh, it has been launched at the beginning of September. 
And we don't have a launch, yet, a launch date yet in North America, but I can tell you one thing. It's coming. And I can also tell you one thing. I'm really, really looking forward to it because I think this is going to be a real breakthrough in the field of canine neonatology. So you see, it has been a very busy summer filled with bursts of scientific excitement. We couldn't tell you all, obviously, because, well, you can see we're quite talkative on these topics, but we think that the points we presented tonight, especially those on neonatology, are going to be real breakthrough in the field of canine repro. So obviously, we don't have solutions yet to everything, whether it's in the field of infertility as well as neonatology, but coming up with new approaches, new strategies, new tools, this is always something very exciting. And I think we can all agree on that. 2016 uh, uh, brought lots of great stuff. And as you may have noticed, based on what I learned this year, I will have to tweak and change several parts of the talks I usually give in Canine Repro now. But that's the beauty of it somehow, you know. We keep learning as we go. And I can tell you one thing. This year was great. I can't wait to see what's next because I'm pretty sure that the future of Canine Repro in general is really bright because there are many, many great teams out there working on topics that are clearly going to change the way we approach this discipline in the future. So guys, our webinar ends here, but as I always say, the discussion continues. You know that by now that we are always happy to help you or your veterinarian if we can. So don't hesitate to join our online community or don't hesitate to follow us on social media, on your favorite social network, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, we, are, we, we are normally everywhere. And one thing I really want to tell you as well, because as Rick mentioned a little bit earlier, this is the last dog breeder webinar for 2016, the last one in English, because tomorrow I still have three to go uh, in French. But we are going to open it up to questions now. So if you have questions, you can send them on, send them on the chat and we'll be more than happy to, to discuss them. But before, we do want to thank you all for again taking part in those online presentations and this online 2016 adventure. Thank you for your engagement because Rick and I did have some great moments this year thanks to you guys. The 2017 season is still in the discussion. You know, it's, it's like that. It's like TV shows. But I really hope that we will meet again during one of those interactive sessions online. So again, thank you so much, guys. Thank you from the bottom of our heart because you made our year. And uh, I hope to see you soon online or who knows, maybe during a live seminar. Thank you. Have a great evening and bye-bye.